this week on the Back Table Podcast. You know, I tell patients every day, my primary job is really getting people across the river. We have this fast flowing river bias of life and you just came upon this problem and, and this is a bad problem and it's going to be in your face. Like it's the way you speak, the way you hear, the way you communicate, the way you see yourself in the mirror. All these things are going to be at the forefront of who you are. And we have to navigate and get across the river, treat a cancer, but give you the quality of life that you're hoping for. And answering all the questions along the way and carrying you and on that journey. So at, at its very fundamental level, I think that what I do and what we do as care providers in the world of cancer is we shepherd people through these challenges. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the show. This is the Back Table ENT podcast, and our goal here is medical education. We seek to accomplish this goal through conversations with experts in the field of otolaryngology, and we hope that you can take this information and apply it to your own practice. I'm Ashley Agan, and I'm a general otolaryngologist practicing in an academic setting at UT Southwestern in Dallas, Texas. My name is Gopi Shaw. I'm a pediatric otolaryngologist practicing at Children's Health in Dallas as well. We're your hosts today, and we're so glad that you stopped by to check out our podcast today. Market declines, unemployment, the COVID-19 pandemic. Don't let headlines derail your long-term financial strategy. This Backtable episode is brought to you by Yafi Tedessa, Edward Jones Financial Advisor in Dallas, Texas. He'll work with you to help you understand the impact of short-term events and how to prepare for the long-term. Learn how he can help you reach your financial goals. Visit edwardjones.com forward slash Yafi, Y-A-P-H-E-T dash Tadessa, T-A-D-E-S-S-E, or backtable.com forward slash 401k for more information. Edward Jones, member SIPC. Ash, you know how important it is for understand how our money works and how we can save for retirement. I invite all of our Backtable listeners to sign up for a webinar that Yafi is giving, just go to backtable.com slash 401k for more information. Ashley, how are you doing today? I'm so good, Gopi. This is like the cherry on top of a really great week. I'm so excited. <laughs> to, this is, I look forward to this every week. Me too. I, you know, well, we got through the storm, not this past week, the week before. And so again, this is, I'm thankful to be here as well today to kind of get, you know, this is a light as well for me. I'm very, very excited for our podcast today. I feel like I'm always excited, but I'm super, especially excited today. Dr. Adam Luganbuehl is our guest today. And Dr. Adam Luganbuehl is an associate professor for the Department of Otolaryngology, Head and Neck Surgery at Thomas Jefferson University Hospital in Philadelphia. He's also the Kimmel Cancer Center Director for the Squamous Cell Carcinoma Tumor Ecology and Microenvironment Working Group. He attained his medical degree from the University of Connecticut School of Medicine and completed his residency in otolaryngology at Thomas Jefferson. He completed his fellowship training in head and neck surgical oncology at Vanderbilt University in Nashville. He was recently awarded the 2021 Edmund Prince Fowler Thesis Award for Basic Science by the Triologic Society for his animal work mitigating tissue damage during radiation. He's the principal investigator for three investigator-initiated immune oncology neoadjuvant trials and head and neck cancer. I'm so very excited to have Adam on the show today. Adam is a close friend of mine. He and I were in the same residency class at Jefferson, and his wisdom and kindness carried me for those five years. And not to say that lightly, but truly, genuinely, I survived with Adam. I swam because of Adam. He's here today to talk to us about immunotherapy and head and neck cancer. Welcome to the show, Adam. Oh, thanks, guys. I'm thrilled to be here. So before we get started, we just wanted you to tell us a little bit about your practice. Yeah, sure. So came back here after training at Vanderbilt, and the practice is a inner city practice that your your major institution here in Philadelphia, where I predominantly focus on two areas of head and neck surgery. One is oncologic practice, where we uh, treat patients with head and neck cancer, and the second part is reconstruction. So free flap reconstruction. And our team is pretty much set up that we tag team all of these cases together. And uh, a part of my practice involves robotic surgery. And in the other part of my life, I think I spend mostly uh, working with 
researchers in the laboratory and clinical investigation, which is probably the, I would say at this point in my career, the, the days I look forward to, to, to pursue some of these questions that plague us in the clinic and trying to bridge the clinical picture that we see in our patients over to our researchers that have the, the wisdom and the insight on how to interrogate their tissue and understand the disease process of cancer and how to try to reverse that process. Awesome. So, so we're going to talk today about cancer immunotherapy. So, you know, just to set the stage for us, can you tell our listeners, you know, when we talk about, when we say head and neck cancer, what, um, what kinds of cancer are we generally referring to? Sure. Head and neck cancer predominantly has always been involving the oral cavity, the larynx, the the, and the oral pharynx, and has usually been associated with tobacco and alcohol as the primary drivers of this cancer. I would say that probably in the last 10, 15, 20 years, we've seen a surge and an increase in oral pharyngeal cancer involving basic tongue and the tonsils that involves human papillomavirus. Additional cancers that we deal with includes thyroid, parotid glands, um, and skin cancer. Certainly, we see a fair amount of skin cancer here that has gotten a bit out of control, and we deal with those that need certainly radical resections. The final area that I would comment on would be skull-based malignancies. So I'd spend a significant time working on tumors that come through the skull base and involve that area. And so when we talk about cancer immunotherapy for head and neck, are we talking about the squamous cell cancers that we traditionally think of? Are you including sort of this entire group of patients when we apply the cancer immunotherapy? Yeah, it's, it's a good question, Gopi. I think that when we think about malignancy as a whole, we're at the infancy really of immunotherapy and trying to understand how it affects certain tumor groups. Certainly in, in the world I work in, squamous cell carcinoma is the most common, so we have the most knowledge about it. But it doesn't mean that every rare or random cancer that comes in, we don't think, could this be applied here? Maybe because it's a rare tumor and we don't see it so frequently doesn't mean it can't be. It just means that we just don't have quite the insight yet. So uh, squamous cell carcinoma certainly is the most common thing that we're going to talk about today, and it's going to be the one that has the most impact on the greatest population. And then when we think about the head and neck cancer patients, you know, we think about, you know, uh, laryngeal cancers, as you said, tongue cancers, tongue-based cancers, and, you know, the types of effects and how it affects patients in terms of speech, swallowing, breathing. There's a lot of functional considerations that we think about when we take care of these patients. What's a traditional, and I, I know it's probably, it's very dependent on how advanced the cancer is and what type, but can you give our listeners just an overview of how you think about what are the important, like your philosophy or what you think about are the most important things in terms of treatment options in term, and then surgery radiation and kind of how, what goes on when a new patient comes in to your clinic? Hmm. Yeah. You know, uh, this is a, this is, this kind of question comes across a lot of times when students come and ask me about why I chose what I do. And I talk to patients about this. I think when we consent a patient about treating, and I know I'm going a roundabout way to answer your question, but I hope it answers that at a more a genuine level about what I think about when I see a patient with head and neck cancer. You know, I tell patients every day, my primary job is really getting people across the river. We have this fast flowing river bias of life and you just came upon this problem and, and this is a bad problem and it's going to be in your face. Like it's the way you speak, the way you hear, the way you communicate, the way you see yourself in the mirror. All these things are going to be at the forefront of who you are. And we have to navigate and get across the river, treat a cancer, but give you the quality of life that you're hoping for. And answering all the questions along the way and carrying you and on that journey. So at, at its very fundamental level, I think that what I do and what we do as care providers in the world of cancer is we shepherd people through these challenges. I think that's a really beautiful way of putting it. I like that. I like that analogy. And I think, you know, for patients who have a new diagnosis, a lot of times it's like, okay, just now, now what you're just going to, you're going to treat it and it's going to be gone, you know? And I think the, the analogy of like this, you know, having this journey with your, with your doctor is a lot more accurate because, because as you say, like a lot of, you know, these head and neck cancers are affecting the way you communicate with the world, your, your face, your, your projection to the world of who you are and um, how you eat. Mm -hmm. If you're going to be able to eat, what you're going to be able to eat when. 
Yeah. 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 I think For sure. it's very well put. So I think now's a good time maybe to kind of pivot and get into, you know, cancer immunotherapy therapy specifically. And I mean, you, you might touch on, or, or you had mentioned that, you know, you do different types of surgeries. You, you, you know, briefly mentioned that there's, you know, maybe chemotherapy or, or radiation or options. Um, specifically today, we're going to kind of look at more of, you know, cancer immunotherapy or also known as immuno-oncology. Can you kind of set the stage for what, what that is? What does that even mean? Yeah, sure. Because it's so amazing and so cool, but I'll try my best to describe it verbally to try to paint a picture. And, and immuno-oncology is is has revolutionized the way we think about cancer care across the board, melanoma, lung cancer, kidney cancer, you name it. It is touching every single aspect of cancer. And in and it in the old, you know, we all I think if you ask an average person on the street, what is it that we treat cancer with, they'd say surgery, radiation, chemotherapy. There's no doubt in my mind that in five years it'll include immunotherapy as the tip of the tongue of every person. And 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 it's I think what we're looking at is really the ability to harness a power that's beyond the drug, right? So the power that allows immunotherapy to have such an effective and profound treatment is it is you. It is your body mechanics killing the cancer. All we're doing with immunotherapy is really opening the doors and opening the gates for you to do what you can do from a biologic standpoint. That being said, you know, if it was such that it was it was easy or was straightforward or cured everyone, we certainly wouldn't be sitting here having this conversation about where we're at and where we're going. But I think if you look at it this way, right, the immune system takes care of viruses, bacteria at an alarming rate every day, surveilling, checking, curing, taking care of, and we, for the most part, are oblivious to it. And in the same fashion, in these same cells, T cells, B cells, APCs, you name them, dendritic cells, they're all recognizing the cancer in these patients and they're hanging out and they make this like little deal. Yo, cancer over there. I see you, you see me, let's make an agreement. We'll just live in harmony. We'll hang out. We'll do a little rap song together. And you just keep on doing your thing and I keep doing my thing. Well, in comes the revolution of immunotherapy where we say, no, breaks on that. Like, that's not cool. Don't do that. And we give permission to these T cells, which are either present or not present, to activate. We give permission to our B cells to start making some memory. And all of a sudden, the cascade just starts from there. And now we're no longer focusing on a target. We're focusing on a process. So, so it's almost like you're saying that our bodies already have the machinery to be able to, you know, identify and, you know, attack and, and, you know, eradicate cancer and that this is kind of allowing, you know, facilitating that process. Yeah, exactly. It, it's really giving so much of it at a very fundamental lay, level is giving permission for the cells to do what they do best and, so, and getting rid of those that are in the way. Because there are certainly, it's a, it's a balance, right? There are a lot of cells that are there that are, you know, you, we have to be careful, right? We could get so excited and say, well, why don't we get rid of all the bad cells and keep all the good cells? Well, some of those bad cells, quote unquote, right? They're inhibitory cells to prevent your bodies from going into fulminant autoimmune disorder. So we can't do that. So there has to be some kind of, and that's kind of what happened in immunotherapy. If we go back to Coley's toxin 100 years ago, I mean, if we go back to interferon treatment in the 1980s, we see very, very sick people getting immunotherapy. And yeah, their cancer might go away, but we destroy them. Right. That's not, that's, that's not acceptable. So this is a little bit more targeted or specific, I guess, to the pathways. We hear the word checkpoint inhibitors. Can you get into that, the pathophys a little bit? I know verbally, yeah. Uh, I, yeah, Ashley and I were talking about, this is going to be tough because we didn't give Adam like a PowerPoint or a whiteboard, you know, because there's pathways, but, um, you know, you have a patient that comes into your clinic and they're like, so what are these checkpoint inhibitors? Hmm. What, 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 you know, cause that's what we hear as the buzzword and what's appro approved, I think so far for head neck cancer. Right. So historically CTLA-4 inhibition was the first checkpoint inhibitor approved. Ipilipimab was improved for melanoma. Oh, I forget the date five years plus or minus, forgive me for not knowing exactly. Following that, certain cancers fell like dominoes as they started to explore, and PD-1 became the next thing. So, so PD-1 and pd one is a linkage, 
think about it this way. You've got a T cell. We know that T cell, for those of you that are listening that are well versed in like uh, this some basic immunology the t cell has the ability to attack and kill another cell or at least has that functionality and then you have the cancer cell and they have this cross linking which is called pd1 and pdl1 and that basically is that signal telling the, the cell just to just to hang out don't do anything don't do anything bad let, let me be here and i'll let you be here if you block so it's like a it's so it's like they're like coexisting like if, yeah. if when that when that's there they're gonna they're gonna both continue to just exist. live their separate best yeah. lives. Yeah, yeah, live your separate best lives. Hanging out, okay. And then when we put PDL, and then when we give a drug like Pembrolizumab or Nivolumab or Optivo slash Keytruda, those are the two ones approved for head and neck cancer in nineteen nine or 2019, they, they block that linkage. And now the T cell wakes up and it's like, holy shnikes, look who's living in my bed. You're not, you're not cool. Like you're out. And then it goes to town and the cascade proceeds. That's all. So to, I guess to focus on your question, the that's where we are right now. We're in this thing where we have these main players on the stage, PD-1 inhibition, CTLA-4 inhibition. Those are the main drugs. The ones that are approved for immunotherapy for head and neck are going to be the PD-1s and the PD-L1 is Dervalimab made by AstraZeneca. They're, they're all in the in that big category. Uh, of checkpoint inhibitors. There are, I guess the last thing I'll say about checkpoints is there's many of them. There's there's Gitter, there's Ox40, there's Tim, there's all kinds of checkpoints that are, are involved in cancer surveillance. So although we're making it incredibly simple today, which I'm a simple person, <laughs> I think it is also incredibly amazing how many checkpoints are engaged and if you turn them all off, what happens? If you turn some of them off, it's like different light switches, if you will. But in general, when we hear checkpoint inhibitors, that's the that's the process we think of. There's different types and different names that we're going to hear, but in general, that's the the process that is happening. That's right. Yep. And then are there other studies for other parts of the immune system, like macrophages or, you know, other players that are involved? Yeah. I think to answer this question, let's back up one second and look at who, how we respond. So if we take head and neck cancer as a whole, the Checkmate trials and the Javelin trials and the different trials that came out in the last two years that look at checkpoint inhibition, they're done in recurrent metastatic cancer patients. So they're advanced stage recurrent disease. And you're looking at about a 15% cure rate. Not great. You're having a bunch of them that are responding, but not all the way to cure. It's certainly better than chemo alone, so it's become the standard of care. So now it's now it's in the standard of care in the advanced recurrent setting. We're working into the upfront primary currently as we speak. We don't have those trials out yet, but recognize that that's pretty not 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 that great of a response. Like you hear excitement in my voice, but it's not necessarily that we're we're knocking this out of the park. So to go back to your question, Gopi, if you think about that as the issue is like all right, so shoot, we're not doing as well as we thought, we hoped. That's where the microenvironment comes in. So all of the research right now, if you look at clinicaltrials.gov, you see all these trials and you look at our trials at Jefferson and across the country, we're all saying, how can we augment the other parts of the immune system to get a response that would be heck of a lot better than 15%, 20%. So for us specifically, we've been modifying and working with um, IDO inhibition, We've been working with the Tadalafil, or sorry, the PDE5 inhibition, all kinds of not really that important statements, but just simply that we're working on trying to get those other parts, the natural killer cells, the MDSCs, all of those things that tie into it out of the way. Can you elaborate a little bit when you about what you mean when you say tumor microenvironment? I think, you know, I was when I was preparing for this, that that came up a lot. And, you know, from what I understand, there's it's almost like that the, the the region where the tumor is may be, you know, immunosuppressed as compared to the body as a whole, or yeah. help me understand that. Right. Yeah. You know, there's so many compartments when we think about this, the complexity is mind blowing. Really. You have your systemic compartment, which is what's going on in the bloodstream, which we can measure and tell what's going on in the local environment. In the local environment, you have an interaction between the tumor and the stroma. And then you have different types of stroma, different phenotypes, so when we talk about the microenvironment, we're talking about what's going on, right? If we have a tumor and in the tumor are some T cells, 
Now, how did they get there? How do they migrate there? How do we increase the number of T cells that are actually active? Are the T so this is all about microenvironment? Are the T cells um, anergic? Do they actually work? Are they senescent? Are they going to sleep? So there's so many different things that just one cell, we're talking about T cells, we can talk about B cells. So one of the things we're currently looking at right now that we've found that tumors are doing is some of them are setting up what's called tertiary, tertiary lymphoid structure. So you get a tumor, we know about antigens, it spills out this antigen, and the antigen then goes to, goes to a B cell. And if you can get a B cell to start making um, antibodies against that antigen, you start to get adaptive immunity. So some of our tumors in the head and neck are forming these small B cell aggregates within the tumor, like little lymph nodes, if you will. They're tertiary. They're not lymph nodes, but they're like them. And they're spewing out, hopefully, antibodies in the treatment and causing direct tumor kill. That's considered, this is all be areas of tumor microenvironment. Is that kind of, when I, I've heard another kind of buzzword, neoantigens, is that sort of the cancer antigens that you're talking about, like the use of neoantigens and being able to then maybe replicate or have the body produce more upregulate, whether it's via B or T cells to then go back and target the cancer and the patients for a patient's cancer. Yeah. And I think this is where we're, we have a paper coming out, hopefully in Frontiers soon, it's in review, talking about the, the value of using checkpoint before surgery. So if I take, if, you know, if I have a patient with a cancer and we remove the cancer and all the cancer's out, and now I give immunotherapy hoping that it will help. Well, the immunotherapy really has no, the immune system is really is like, all right, you just gave me this drug, where's the tumor? There's not enough volume of tumor here for me to actually mount a response. Even if there's single cells left, it's not enough. You just removed all that cancer. So the thought that we're working with is, and all of our trials are designed this way, is while the patient has the tumor, give them a dose of immunotherapy. One dose, maybe two, then operate neoadjuvant immunotherapy, what you're doing there is, Gopi, just like you said, you're letting the neoantigens that we know are flying around the system, they're in the bloodstream, we can find them in the microenvironment. Let those start to make some memory cells, then operate, and then let the immune system do what it knows how to do, and that's surveil. Now we have this huge surveillance system that's like self-inflicted, and it can surveil you know, who knows what will happen, but maybe in five, 10 years when the cancer wants to creep back up, those B cells are like, uh, uh not again. I've already seen you and you're not allowed here. That's genius. Yeah. So what it seems like, and again, when we, so when you talk to patients about the checkpoint inhibitors that, you know, the drugs that are available, it seems like, yes, it, it helps in terms of survival or cure, or does it buy them more time? Are you talking months? Are you talking years, several years? Uh, is it more pa symptom palliation relief? Yeah. Yeah. For, for those of us that see patients on a regular basis, or fam maybe some of us listening to this will have a family member with cancer, and this might help in some way. One of the, the beautiful things about this that I, I think is most replicated and probably first produced was in melanoma. And we're seeing the same thing in head and neck. It's this thing called the long tail. So you give, let's talk about chemotherapy first as a baseline. You give someone chemotherapy A, and then you give another patient chemotherapy B. And what we saw with chemotherapies is it may be extended life for six months, 10 months, but ultimately everybody died in the, in the, in the group of bad patients that are really sick, that are just not going to survive. We're not talking about curable people. We're talking about really different ones. With immunotherapy, we see a different curve. We see that curve where you not only have six or seven months progression free survival and improvement, but you have this long tail at about 15, 20% where they just survive. And, and the beautiful pictures we have of these PET scans of people with melanoma everywhere, bones, lungs, everywhere. And then the next PET scan, nothing. And they go on for five, 10, 15, 20 years. That's, that's revolutionary. That's new. That's a different expectation. Now you're sitting with a patient. We as doctors often think of population science, right? Unfortunately, the patient thinks about them as a person. One of the hardest things we had to do to translate for a patient is our brain thinking in curves of survival and length to what does this mean for this father in front of me? Yeah. How do I translate that hope? And yet the reality that we're, we're, we're not doing great so 
I, and, and then the final thing is the side effect profile. Chemotherapy side effect profile, we've proven that in head and neck. Bob Ferris's paper in New England Journal of Medicine looking at nivolumab demonstrated clearly that those in really advanced recurrent disease just had a better quality of life. Even though they only extended life by seven months, their quality of life was so much better during that time getting immunotherapy versus chemotherapy. And so it seems like this is at this point used for your advanced head neck cancer patients. So what's tumor board like? Like how do you, who, you know, when you go to tumor board, where is the immunotherapy? When and how is it brought up? Is it, okay, this is the 72 year old male history of, you know, laryngeal cancer 20 years ago, had radiation. Now there's recurrence. We did a laryngectomy, positive margins, you know, the ends, the next status, and where does the you know cancer immunotherapy come into play? Like, where's the discussion? Yeah. How's the discussion go? Yeah, I'm the discussion is 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 on one hand there are clear standards of care, FDA approved. Your standard of care is immunotherapy. That is in your recurrent or metastatic case. Multiple trials have shown that it's better than extreme, the extreme trial modality of chemotherapy. So. Check. We have that. There's no debate there. I think where the debate comes is in the upfront situation in our trials. So right now, we don't have the data to say that it should be used in the upfront setting. We're currently working on it. There are multiple trials running right now for that. And again, we absolutely encourage people to get involved in clinical trials. But for example, the discussion comes that I think for me that I struggle with personally on the ethics side of things, patient in the clinic, like you said, sitting in front of me with a just this happened this week, rapidly growing tumor in the oral cavity. They're in lots of pain. They're not eating. And you want to give them, you want to put them on the Nevo IDO trial and you want to give them a dose of nivolumab and you want to wait four weeks to see how it responds. And if it responds, you give them another dose. If it doesn't respond, you take them to surgery. Man, that's, that's kind of hard to say to a patient, you're struggling, you're suffering. I want you to hang in there for a hope that this might get a response and we're going to have to operate either way. And so I would say that that's where I personally will say, where are you at right now with, you, with your cancer in terms of how it's affecting your life? And if it's real bad, without the evidence yet to show that it's going to move that patient in a meaningful direction, I have to say that I still lean towards getting that patient in soon, like within the week or two. Because you just don't want to see people suffer when you don't have the evidence or data that it's going to make a meaningful difference. That's where I say tumor board is where we're trying to figure out how best to use our trials with our excitement, but recognize the patients on the other end of this. Right. When you say take a patient sooner, I believe you mean, you know, take the patient to surgery sooner. I just wanted to confirm that we're talking about, you mean you're going to, you're going to elect to do surgery because we, that is a known, that's a, a known outcome that, you know, we can make them feel better, prevent suffering. Whereas there's still some uncertainty with cancer immunotherapy. Is that fair? Yeah. That, that's, that's such a great way to ask the question. Cause it's so true, right? You, I feel like we're feeling our way a little bit in the dark here in this in this angle. And one of the passionate things I want to be part of as a surgeon studying this stuff is when the patient walks in the office, we continue as researchers to look at the patient and say, what is this patient? How can I help this patient better? And then you translate it into science. I So in the last trial, we just finished with using nivolumab plus Cialis. Don't ask me. We can talk about why I use Cialis. But we had 50 patients and half my patients had a remarkable response and the other half did not. They didn't progress, but they didn't have a great response. It was about a 50% response. They're all never been treated before, HPV negative, positive. And I'm looking at this patient and I'm taking them literally with one dose of nivolumab plus Cialis. I take them to the OR four weeks later and my, my staging is T0 N0. Wow. Do you rescan them? Like yeah, we rescan them. Okay. Demonstrate that they're gone like it's gone away. You take everything out, do the same surgery. That being said, the next patient I have has no response. Wow. And so you where do I want to be in 10 years, Ash? I want to be in the place where it's like you walk in, I get your blood, I get a sample, I take it to the laboratory, and I come back and say, you don't need to waste your time with immunotherapy. We need to go to conventional surgery, radiation, chemotherapy, or like 
hey, you won the lottery. Or, yeah, you got cancer, but we have all the markers that point to you being a responder. So one of the beautiful things about surgeons being involved in clinical trials, right, is we have great control over two things. One, the referral base. We have lots of patients coming through. Two, their specimens. So every single specimen we get, we take over to the lab, we sequence it, we run tons of analysis to try to understand that profile of why that patient came out to be a T0N0 after being T2N2B. Like what happened in four weeks? versus that other patient that didn't budge. And so I think in stating it that way, it's our hope that in five, 10 years, we can get to the point where we can be better at predicting because not everybody's going to respond. So have y'all been able to see, um, are there certain tumor genetic markers or HPV status or uh, risk factors that either make um, a patient a better candidate or not? Do we know these yet? Are HPV positive more, you know, responsive to immuno cancer? Not, you know, is it all the same? Are, are you know, tobacco users or chewers more or less responsive? Or have any of those things been able to be teased out? Oh, Gopi, I wish we, we could say at this point that we do. Crazy thing is, is that your HPV positive cancers live in immune structures, the tonsil. It's a lymph node. And for, for some strange reason, there is, it's a different phenotype. And all those immune cells there, it, it doesn't predict whether they're going to... Right now in our trial, we have 50% HPV positive and 50% HPV ne negative. And it's a wash. We have some that are responding in both groups. I have complete responders in both groups. So that's not going to predict for us. PDL1 and PD1 staining, it's uh, kind of helpful, but not great. It's really poor. What we are finding, at least what we have found in, in our HPV negative group, our smokers, drinkers, is if they're an immune desert on their pre treatment sample, take a sample, check it out, there's no immune cells. They don't respond, they don't generate immune response. On the other hand, on those HPV negative samples, if we take the sample over and we look and we find all kinds of, you know, some T cells, nothing like the HPV positive group, but we find some immune cells, we're stoked. Those people have, can generate and produce a significant response. So prediction, look for, if you're looking for like the future and looking for things that will evolve in this whole thing, I think it's the, the ability to be somewhat predictive and then be prescriptive with who should and who shouldn't get these things. You know, in thinking about this, I, I'm curious if you guys have seen any sort of association with, you know, comorbid diseases like, you know, diabetes and high blood pressure, high cholesterol, like are those patients less likely to have an immune system that's going to work for them um, in the same way that we see worse outcomes with like COVID-19 infection? I mean, have you guys seen that? Yeah, Ashley, good question. I don't think that they're that not really. Let's take a, a few populations aside. People that have autoimmune disorders already, we're not really giving this to because we don't want to exacerbate them or cause them greater issues. Although we've talked about the excitement of this, there are some significant side effects in certain groups of patients that can be life altering in major ways. And so we, we don't want to just say, oh, this is amazing. This is great. We do want to say that, but we also want to say we need to be careful. So take, a, take aside the group that's at high risk for that. Take aside the group that's already immunodeficient, HIV, uh, liver transplants, organ transplants. We certainly want to, we were having a hard time considering, should we give it to somebody with a liver transplant? You know, we wouldn't want to have cause rejection. Yes, no, we don't need to, I'll leave that to my medical oncology colleagues to articulate that. But Beyond that, no, we're not. I put it in diabetics. We put it in people that have obesity. The only thing that we are, and we just recently came through on, which is fascinating, is if you get the therapy and you develop a rash or you develop some small irritation or thyroiditis, you are much more likely to be a responder than if you get nothing. Now, is that going to bear out and be true across the board? I don't know. I don't know if it's generalizable. We're just starting to see these trends. So if someone comes in after getting a dose and be like, yeah, man, I've got the worst rash ever. I'm stoked. That's great. You know, it's good, good, good deal. So interesting. It, can you, um, you, you brought up, you know, some 
contraindications potentially. Can you talk about side effects and and you know absolute contraindications? Yeah, certainly. I think the the contraindications are going to be those that are have autoimmune disorders already: lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, even diabetes type one. We'd exclude at this point from our trials. I don't know if they're medical. I, I'm going to defer a little bit to our medical oncology colleagues because they're going to know some of these details better than I will from actually clinical practice. I want to be careful I'm not overstepping my statements here. And then side effects that that we have noticed that we're always following and we recognize are real are the development of autoimmune disorders. I have had one patient in trial develop severe fit of liver failure, and it, they're rare, but they do happen and they can happen. And you have to when you talk to the patient about putting them on a trial or engaging them, you have to, it's, so, so why this is important, in an end stage, really sick patient with cancer, you're going to accept certain degrees of risk. A 55-year-old coming in with a T2N1 tonsil cancer, it's hard to sometimes make that argument when you're like, all right, you have a 98% survival rate. And we're going to give you a drug that may make your liver fall apart. So we just have to be aware of those those ethical considerations as we move into this era. So overall, I mean, since we were in residency together 10 years ago, it feels like, I, or no, yeah, when we finished, <laughs> by the time we finished, it seems like, and I don't recall as much uh, cancer immunotherapy at our tumor board discussions. I don't remember discussing them. So uh, it's very new for me, especially because I do PEDS. How has it changed the way you practice or think about it? I mean, it seems like there's Obviously, you've thrown yourself into the research and you genuinely want to understand the, the disease process. How has it changed your practice or impacted you the most in the last five years? As a surgeon, I think I'd go back to the first thing we made earlier in the conversation. Early on, when you start as a new surgeon, all of us can recognize that we are enthusiastic about treating the disease we've been trained to treat. And as you get more and more into it and you start to see some of the consequences of your treatment, you start to become a little bit horrified that you are, you, you're doing your best, but you recognize that, man, I just removed this person's voice box. I just, yesterday, I, we just, I did a hemifacectomy. What am I doing? Can I make myself obsolete? And I think that's when I see a patient and I look at this treatment in this modality, Although it's given by and predominantly treated by with medical oncologists, as a surgeon, I want to be at the table to have that conversation with my colleagues about the value of this and where does it fit? We don't know yet, but if we can, when I look at that patient sitting in front of me, I'd want nothing more than for me to say, I have a friend in medical oncology that can get this better and you don't need me. I know that's probably not great for job security, but it is. <laughs> I, I hope it's better for these patients. Yeah. No, I think at this point in our careers, I think we've seen and done enough to understand the, the greater value and the greater good. As a surgeon, you're not the martyr. You're not a, you know what I mean? That, that, right. That's not sustainable and it's not good for the patient. Um, it's not good care. So I, pre I appreciate the looking at the entire picture. So, so do you imagine a future in which this, you know, immunotherapy, cancer immunotherapy might be a first line treatment for patients? I do. I, I really do. I think that there's going to become a time where it will become into the first line. And I, I also do envision a time that surgery will always be relevant. I don't think it will never be obsolete. I just think it will be with a more thoughtful approach and with another alternative that we can look at. And when we weigh and look at the value. Going back to surgery, I don't want to, I don't, I, it'd be mistaken for me to portray that all surgery is, is terrible. It, it is. Surgery is very curative. And I believe in the trade and I believe in what we do. And I, patients are very grateful. But I do see a future where we have this just wonderful, powerful tool that can be very useful. I learned so much from you during our time in residency. Obviously, in our conversation today, you are dear to me. So thank you so much for joining us. Do you have any other final pearls or uh, last thoughts that you want to leave with our listeners on this topic or your philosophy on life, anything? Mm, 
Not, not in particular. I think, I guess I would just express a, a similar degree for, for listeners that listen to, to both of you every week. I have a distinct memory of Gopi, many, many memories, but one in particular I'd like to share, which has to do with her tenacity. For those of you that went through residency before the era of electronics, you remember having to collect films. And you, as the, the, in our residency, the second year resident was in charge of films and she had been looking for this film and I had had it in my bag and long and short, she found out I had had it and she had asked me multiple times. But so when Gobi proceeded to yell at me, um, hmm. she didn't just yell at me standing up. She got up on a chair. I did? Yeah. You stood on a chair in, in the resident room while I was seated down to ensure that your emphatic just di- un- unhappiness <laughs> was, was made known. I'm just going to pat myself on the back yeah. for that one right now. <laughs> yeah, I, I was like, okay, I think she's really pissed. <laughs> but we got the films, the patients were t- patient was taken care of, so. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. That's awesome. Well, no, thank you for letting me hang out with you guys. And, and hopefully, if anything else, I've shared a little bit of uh, maybe my, my enthusiasm has rubbed off and, and that this is, this is just an awesome time to be in medicine. Thank you for for spend, you know taking the time to talk to us today about a pretty amazing topic. I I look forward to kind of seeing how all this plays out, you know, over the next several years. For for listeners um, that want to um, learn more, do you have any recommendations on how to you know maybe find out more about you or any any good online resources that you send people to? A uh, great question about resources. I think that certainly sticking with if you're, if you're if you're in medicine and treat patients, there are great review articles that you can get on immunotherapy and head and neck. Just put them into your PubMed search, and it will generate. Right now, I'm sure there's three or four really strong ones that kind of go over the the latest. That'd be the primary place I'd send a medical provider to. And then if you're a patient listening to this. Certainly, the main cancer websites, NCCN guidelines, the NCI, the and American Head and Neck Society are great websites to have patient center. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you to our listeners for tuning in. You can find our podcasts on Spotify, Apple, iHeartRadio, SoundCloud. And please take a moment to subscribe, rate, and share the podcast. This will help us grow and support our efforts to bring you this free content as much as possible. And follow us on social media. We're on Instagram and Twitter at underscore backtable ENT. I think that's a wrap. It's a wrap. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>